welcome you to the Scriptorium Study Center. Uh, my name is Paul. I'm uh, one of the pastors here at University Chapel and St. Thomas Mission, and I uh, host and run all of the things that we do here in the Scriptorium. Uh, so very excited. This is the first event we've had here that's been coordinated by someone else, and we've just been able to host it in this space. Um, and that's really cool to be able to partner with the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation for this event. Uh, as we begin, as um, we do for our events, uh, we're going to acknowledge and we acknowledge that we are here at University Chapel on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. So we take a moment to acknowledge and honor the generations of First Nations people who have walked here before us and stewarded this land through past centuries. And as God's agents of reconciliation and peace, to commit ourselves to work for harmony in society, a society that is just and peace, peaceful for all. Many of you will be totally unfamiliar with the Scriptorium Study Center, and that's okay. I'm not going to say too much. Um, but here at UBC, this is a space, an idea that we've been sort of incubating for the past few years and has just really come to fruition this year as an idea, and now not only as a space, but as a community that you are all a part of. The Scriptorium is part of the Consortium of Christian Study Centers, which are a network of like-minded um, spaces on university campuses all across North America, mostly in the United States, but there is one in Canada, which is here. Um, they do various things, study centers, but the gist of it is the integration of, of faith and learning, church and academy, and the scriptorium in particular I think of it as less of a space, a building, a room, and more of a community of friends, old and new, students and scholars, leaders and learners, uh, who are gathering together you know, to s consider and to speak about you know, God's work and his ways in the world and to discover more about him and his creation together. So we do that through events like this, public talks, uh, lectures, we've done it with uh, round table conversations and film nights and we've had poetry readings, um, small group discussions, and we also host regular um, just open house study hours for students to come here, kind of just a coffee shop drop in and study during the week. Um, all of this is this idea of learning together um, about our creator and the world that he has created and that we get to share together. Um, we have some upcoming events. These ones are all public talks like tonight, and they're all on Wednesday evenings this semester. So I encourage you to look at that. And if you have any questions or you want to get on our email list, talk to me, um, or you can um, follow the QR code that's on this um, card and that will take you to the website. I think Arnold is going to come up and give a welcome from the CSCA. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, and welcome everyone here as, uh, on behalf of the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation. So I'm the Executive Director. Uh, my name is Arnold Sikama, I, uh, and I've been associated with the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation since about 1996, when I was a graduate student here at UBC in physics. And I now teach physics at Trinity Western University, and I've, I've been on the Executive Council for the CSCA since 2011. So we are a national association of, of Christians in the sciences uh, for fellowship and networking and mentoring and scholarship um, and, uh, and encouragement uh, as we deal with matters of science and faith uh, in our classrooms, in our labs, in our companies, in our government uh, facilities, etc. So we're really a broad uh, collection of, in, from students to retirees. Uh, from people in the in the natural sciences to other disciplines uh, relating to the natural sciences, like uh, philosophy, history, theology, and those sorts of things. And we really uh, encourage um, students to join, and therefore we give students free membership. Um, and uh, we encourage others to join as well, and to contribute to the ability for us to keep holding events like this, local events from coast to coast, 
um, but also national events, like you'll see on the cycle of slides here, a uh, conference happening in July at the University of Toronto, Mississauga, that we've been being, uh, planning for a while. Uh, in particular, this year is our 50th anniversary. So 1973 was the formation of the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation. There's a U.S. association which, in a sense, birthed us. Uh, they've been around since, I believe, 1941. Uh, so they are older than we are, uh, which is normal in birthing, I suppose. Uh, and so uh, we have a number of celebratory events all throughout the year. So um, one of the websites that you could go to and explore is csca.ca slash 50, uh, 50, and that'll give you all of the uh, anniversary celebration events, uh, which of which this is one. So one of the events that we're uh, uh, doing to celebrate is to have past presidents of the association uh, give lectures uh, from uh, in various chapters. So we have chapters in Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary, Saskatchewan, Winnipeg, um, Hamilton, uh, Waterloo, Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, and Nova Scotia. I think I got them all. It was that 11? Any of them counting? Uh, so that's our, those are our local chapters. Uh, and we have, um, we're, we partner with the American Scientific Affiliation a lot. Uh, and in terms of publications like the journal and the quarterly newsletter, but this year we also have a 50th anniversary newsletter. You can also find on the on the csc.ca slash 50 uh, website. So, um, and our speaker today is Dr. Robert Mann, who is a past president of the Canadian Scientific and Commission Affiliation, hence the past president's lecture series. Mm -hmm. And so this is the second of these lectures already, because the first one was held this afternoon at one o'clock at Trinity Western University. A number of us were there for that as well. And that topic was uh, to infinity and beyond 50 years of work in science and faith. And uh, Robert Mann is, uh, is a professor of physics at the University of Waterloo and at the Perimeter Institute in Waterloo, which is sort of a theoretical physics think tank, if you will. Um, and uh, when he uh, was early at the University of Waterloo, I was an undergraduate student at the University of Waterloo in physics. And so my first uh, research collaboration was with Dr. Robert Mann, that we did a work on gravitation and cosmology together. And he has continued that work in gravitation and cosmology and other fields over the years and decades. Uh, since then, I've uh, switched into a different uh, field. I went into condensed matter uh, theory for my graduate work, and now I do some uh, thinking about uh, philosophical and Christian connections between biology and physics. So uh, that's probably... Uh, all about me, and I'll say a few more words about uh, Dr. Robert Mann. Um, he was the president of the CSEA in the 1990s and into the early uh, 2000s. Uh, a number of us in this room uh, have been executive council members of the, of the CSEA, which does have members from uh, uh, throughout, the, throughout the country as well. Um, he has uh, quite a few graduate students uh, still. Uh, three of them are expecting to graduate this year with their PhDs. Uh, he has published around uh, 500 journal articles uh, in in the fields of physics, which you've represented, and only three of them with me. So, um, <laughs> so tonight's talk is about time and eternity. Thank you all for coming, and let's welcome Dr. Robert Mann. So, uh, thank you very much, Arnold, for your kind words and introduction, and to. Paul for uh, hosting me in the uh, scriptorium here. And uh, I'd also like to thank Mark McEwen for all his technical work behind the scenes that uh, would be very much different if it, the expectation were that the speaker would do it. <laughs> not that I'm not tech adept, but it's difficult to have two minds at once. So thank you everybody for uh, coming out tonight. Um, I thought, I would talk a little bit about something that interests me as a consequence of the type of research I do uh, in science, which is namely uh, the nature, we'll bend this down a bit, uh, which is namely has to do with the nature of time and its implications for our maybe uh, theological understanding of reality, uh, what we might call eternity. Uh, here in the 50th uh, anniversary year of the CSCA. Uh, I like to think this is my 50th anniversary of beginning a career in science. Uh, 
1973 is the year I finished the 12th grade, after which uh, we were, although Ontario required one more year of high school uh, relative to the rest of the country, at that time we were required to specialize and that was the year I knew I was going to go into the sciences, so I took uh, three mathematics, physics, chemistry and geography and I ended up in the discipline of physics, but theoretical physics, which is pretty close to math. So time, what is time? Well, we're all used to it in everyday life. We'd say right now it's about uh, 16 minutes before eight o'clock in the evening. But in physics, we like to think about what this really means. And this goes way back to uh, Leibniz, who after Newton, um, came up with his basic theory of uh, mechanics and motion, uh, debated with uh, him on it. And, and there came to be two views of this subject expressed by each. And Leibniz's view is that time is relational, whereas Newton's was that time is absolute. And we are still, uh, centuries later, struggling uh, as scientists in physics at a fundamental level as to which of these views is correct, or is there perhaps some third view in between them? So the view on the left uh, is expressed this way, and I've, I've got, uh, uh, this is Leibniz's original writing, so it's, perhaps a bit archaic, but I'll try and, if you like, deconstruct it for you after I read it. Suppose anyone should ask why God did not create everything a year sooner, and the same person should infer from thence that God has done something concerning which it is not possible there should be a re reason why he did it so and not otherwise. Uh, I'll interpret it in a minute. <laughs> the answer is that his inference would be right if time was anything distinct from things existing in time. For it would be impossible there should be any reason why things should be applied to such particular instance rather than to others. Their succession continuing the same. But then the same argument proves that instance considered without the things are nothing at all and that they consist only in the successive order of things. So what he's saying at the beginning is, God created the universe some time ago. Why wasn't it a year earlier or a year later? And he says, if, if you think about that, there isn't any reason at all for it if time was distinct from other things like this podium or the air or planets or whatever that existed. And so what he's saying here is that the question makes no sense and time makes no sense mm -hmm. apart from the existence of other things. And this is the relational idea. The same argument proves that instants considered without things are nothing at all. They only, all that time means is the successive ordering of things. It's like arranging names in alphabetical order. It has no other significance than that, ultimately. That would be Leibniz's view, whereas Newton's would be the following. Supposing absolute true and mathematical time of itself and from its own nature flows equably without relation to anything external and by another name is called duration. Relative apparent and common time is some sensible and external, whether accurate or unequable, measure of duration by means of motion, which is commonly used instead of true time, such as an hour, a day, month, or a year. So what he's saying is time is actually an absolute thing that exists without relation to anything else. What we do is we measure this thing that exists, but the measurement shouldn't be confused with the existence of the thing itself. So the second part says that, that the way we measure it might be accurate or it might not be quite accurate, but that doesn't mean time doesn't exist. And so our notions of hours or days or months, that tells us how much we measure. It's a bit like time is a river flowing and we can measure the flow of the river or not, 
But if we don't measure it, it doesn't mean the river isn't flowing. Whereas Leibniz's view is the, the whole notion of a river flowing like time is simply the relationship between the river and the land and has no other absolute meaning. So that, that sort of set the stage really in science for what I think has still gone on as to what the nature of time is ever since. So assuming I've got time, I, I'll talk a little bit about the origin of time, whether or not time has a beginning the direction of time, namely why is the future different from the past, uh, measurement of time a little bit, how do we know what time it is, um, our perspectives on time, whose time is it that we are measuring, and finally a notion of ultimate destiny. Uh, is there an ultimate time out, so to speak? So I'll go from beginning to end and do things in the middle. So what about the origin of time? Well, we certainly perceive, since I noticed it was 16 minutes to eight, now it's about 10 to eight. Time, we would say, has gone forward. And if we go backward and backward, right, this, we had, uh, the, this event started at 7.30, we had a dinner beginning at 5.30, some of you got up early this morning. You can go backwards and backwards and ask the question, how far can you go? Does, it, does time go backwards forever, or is there an ultimate beginning to time? And the answer is not immediately or entirely obvious. Uh, the way this question can be asked is, has the universe always existed, or did it begin some finite time ago? And uh, in the early 1900s, by about uh, around 1912, the general scientific consensus, I think, would have been that, that it's the first one. There's no reason, uh, if you like, from the Leibnizian viewpoint, that there should have been a beginning. Because if, if it was so long ago, well, why wasn't it here? Or why wasn't it here? Whereas you remove that problem if it goes back indefinitely, assuming that really is a problem. Well, here's a picture of a galaxy very much like our own. It has spiral arms, and we're pretty sure that this is what the uh, Milky Way looks like. And we live on a planet orbiting a star in a galaxy that is in an expanding universe that began explosively about 13 billion years ago. I think it's about 13.8 plus or minus now less than a percent. And this is a remarkable scientific achievement. When I was an undergraduate student, the age of the universe was only known within a factor of two. But now we have measurements indicating that we know its age to within less than a percent, error-wise. So we've learned that our universe is expanding with galaxies receding from one another at ever-increasing rates. This was first observed by Hubble. Uh, where he, um, as I said, prior to 1928, there was a feeling the universe should be uh, eternal and therefore galaxies should be moving higgledy-piggledy randomly like molecules in a gas. And Hubble set out to measure some of these motions of what came to be called galaxies. It wasn't even clear there were such things as late as the as late as 1920. And what he discovered is that although a few nearby ones were moving piggledy piggledy a bit, if you went out to any reasonable galactic distance, they were moving away. And the farther away they are, the faster they were moving. It was as though there was, uh, they were the remnants of a big explosion or expansion. And so extrapolating backward, one got to a number between 10 and 20 billion years, uh, and this picture has since been refined to uh, the 13.78 billion. These were called, these structures we call galaxies were conjectured to exist by Immanuel Kant in the 1700s. They were called island universes. This was a different picture of the universe. Stars were not spread uniformly every, everywhere. They were collected in clumps called galaxies. 
our own galaxy is about 100,000 light years across, or if you like the number in kilometers, it's that much right there. I won't beat it out for you. And we live out in the galactic suburbs somewhere. If this were our galaxy, we would be out there in one of the not very densely populated regions. And we now know yet another discovery in my lifetime that at the core of the galaxy, there is a super gigantic black hole that in our galaxy is about four and a half million times as heavy as the sun. And what we've discovered is pretty much every galaxy has one of these things at its core. When I was an undergrad, I was told black holes probably don't exist. That's how much science has changed within my uh, career lifetime. So our, the contents of our universe are a remnant of a cosmic explosion, and it means our universe has a history. It has a history. It has a beginning. And the very constants in the equations of physics seem to take on uniquely special values, without which life isn't possible. So why do we believe this? As I said, we see the expansion. That's what Hubble saw. We see the heat from the expansion, and we see the debris from the explosion. Let me sketch these out for you. How did Hubble see the expansion? Using redshifts. This is a phenomenon that you can easily see with sound if an ambulance or a fire engine goes by. If it's coming to, if it's sitting still and the siren's on, you'll hear a pitch like, but if it's coming towards you, it'll be a higher pitch. You'll hear, and if it's going away, you'll hear, I learned something from being a choir, I hope. <laughs> so what, what's going on is the sound waves, if you're standing over here and the siren is coming towards you, the sound waves get scrunched up a bit and the frequency goes up. There's more of these uh, crests and troughs per unit time. If you were over here, it's going away from you and so they look like they stretch out. Now the same phenomenon happens with light and uh, as a consequence, if we know there are things out there where the light should be a certain color, which can be inferred from the basic interactions of the molecules, um, we can then, if all those interaction light patterns are shifted in a blue or a red direction, we can infer the speed. And that's what Hubble did. Hubble discovered that galaxies are basically all redder than they should be. And this infer from this, he inferred this uh, galactic expansion, where here is a diagram from his original paper, where from the redshift, he plotted the speed, and from the brightness, he could infer the distance. And he discovered some of them have negative speed. A few of them means are moving toward us. But you can see on the graph, most of them are moving away. And there, were, uh, there was a lot of scatter in the plot. From this, he inferred something we now call Hubble's Law, that the speed of the galaxy is equal to the distance times some constant, namely the constant that tells you how sloped this line is. We call that now Hubble's constant. Well, measurements continued, and today, this is what the graph looks like. You can see all the points come pretty darn close to a straight line, and Hubble actually only observed this part. We've gone out far, far more in the universe to speeds much greater, distances much, much larger. These are in megaparsecs, which is one megaparsec is three million light years. So this is 15 billion, uh, like, uh, no, not 15 million, 1.5 billion light years. Sorry, there we go. Roughly. So that was measured by the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe about 20 some odd years ago called WMAP. And this is why we think the universe is expanding and had a beginning. It's not a prejudice. It, it's a scientific finding. And that constant H naught is now measured to be this much. There's still some 
tension over the value of this. Measurements around here make this number, I'm trying to remember which way it goes, I think the measurements nearby make this number about 74, measurements way out here make it about 68. The methods are different and so it's not clear amongst astronomers which one is right and they're still trying to converge, but there's no question that it's around this value that I've quoted in, in that ballpark. So we have these cosmic origins. Here is our universe now. Uh, we have been able to observe this pattern of radiation 380,000 years after the dawn of creation. Before that, we have to infer from theory what might have happened. Many people think that cosmic inflation uh, has played a role, but we have corroborated these Hubble uh, measurements by the age of globular clusters, which are little globs of stars that orbit near galaxies, the age of brown dwarf stars, and the ages of the oldest elements. There's all a consistency. You can imagine we'd be in trouble if independent measurements said the age of the oldest elements was 25 billion years old. There'd be a very clear conflict, but this, in fact, does not happen. But of course, if time has a beginning, then we have, well, we have some interesting questions to deal with, I think. Namely, what happens at the boundary? How did things get started? What boundary conditions do we set? Who or what, maybe I should say what or who, sets these conditions? Should there be any boundary conditions at all? This is, has been viewed by some physicists as repugnant, which is why they try to make models that get rid of the beginning, because then you get rid of this problem of what sets the boundary conditions. Augustine actually had an intuition that the universe was not eternal, but was finite. He said, God, who is eternal, has created time with a beginning and an end. And we have very good reason to believe this part is correct. Now, yeah, factually correct. I'll say something about that latter part a bit later. So what about before the beginning? This is the conundrum in physics. If the laws of physics began at the Big Bang, then there's no physics before that and the laws of nature break down. They, they sort of don't really even exist. So then you have a bit of a Leibnizian question. Well, why did they break down way back then and not at some other times or some other places in space? Why begin this way and not some other way? So is this a, a sort of a science stopper? And, and the question raised in fundamental physics is should a proper and complete cosmological theory provide its own boundary conditions? Many would regard this as ideal. If we get the right theory, we won't have to tell it what happened at the boundary. The theory will tell us. That's the hope. And we still don't know. There isn't any good answer to this. Hawking proposed something called a no boundary condition that was along these lines. Uh, but it, it turned out that that proposal didn't really work out the way he hoped or anticipated. So again, what do we do with this? Do we admit defeat? Do we appreciate mystery? And, and I think I'll, I'll just leave it at that. I, my personal view is the beginning of the universe does have theological significance. I don't think it is a theologically irrelevant feature of reality. I think it is something that should cause any person pause to think. It didn't have to be this way. Observation could have shown us the universe was eternal. Would that mean God didn't exist? Well, I don't know, but I think it would certainly be a very different picture that was perhaps less congruent with, with biblical insight and thought. All right, what about the direction of time, the arrow of time? Well. What the laws of physics are about when you teach them at the beginning is you teach about you teach students about how things move. And here's an example of this little ball. You see my yeah, this little ball moving as a consequence of somebody hitting it with a tennis racket. And what we know near the Earth's surface is that these balls follow a parabolic shape. And this is due to the near constancy of gravity of the gravitational force at the surface of the Earth. So the ball always traces out the general shape of a parabola. 
It might be a very narrow parabola, like the lob. It might be a very broad parabola if you give it a smash, but it's going to be a parabola. Once that ball has left the racket, it has to do that. The shape is independent of what the ball is made of. That's called the equivalence principle, whether it's a tennis ball or a rock or anything where you can neglect air resistance, it's going to follow that path. Um, and then finally, the specific type of parabola depends on this person, namely how they hit the ball. Did they give it a smash? Did they give it a high lob? Or, or what did they do? The player hits the ball at a given time and place. This is what we call an initial condition or a boundary condition, just like at the beginning of the universe. So our brain set this condition, which I think is a fascinating scientific problem in and of itself. But in physics, we just accept that we can set these conditions. And once set, we find that the geometry of the motion is smooth, it's deterministic, and it's predictable. If not, sports games would be impossible. Right? You imagine, all right, he's coming back for the linebacker, he's throwing a ball. What if the football zoomed around like a bumblebee? <laughs> How could you play football? It would be impossible. The predictability of nature is what makes sports possible. But it's not fully rigidly predictable because the variability is right there in how people get the motion started. So, Laplace took this rather seriously and thought the following. He said, an intelligence knowing at a given instant of time all forces acting in nature, as well as the momentary position of everything of which the universe consists, would be able to comprehend the motions of the largest bodies of the world and those of the lightest atoms in one single formula provided his intellect were sufficiently powerful to subject all data to analysis. To him, nothing would be uncertain. Both past and future would be present in his eyes. In other words, he figured out, look, suppose at one instant, somebody was smart enough to know everything, every position and the speed of everything in the universe. Then they would be able to predict the entire future of everything in the universe if they had the ability to, if they knew the laws of physics well enough. That was the idea, and it leads to the notion, well, maybe we don't need an intelligence, but surely the laws of physics fully deterministically predict everything. So that argument would go. And we, from that, get this notion of reversibility. We have an initial condition, like hitting the ball at the tennis racket. The laws of physics then tell us where the ball is going to go at some later time. But you could reverse this. Suppose the position and speed of the ball at the later time is taken to be the initial condition, and we run time backwards. Well, then it's got to go to what we started at. And we have that because Newton's laws are the same whether time runs forward or whether it runs backward. It looks exactly the same. And this looks like a, a seamless causal web. But what we've discovered over the years is it's not quite that straightforward. In fact, there are eight arrows of time. One of them I've already talked about. The universe is expanding. It's bigger today than yesterday. Empty space is literally getting larger instant by instant. That's a forward arrow of time, or rather you could say the bigger the universe, the later the time. There is a radiative arrow that you're experiencing right now. Sound and light go outward. They don't converge. The sound I'm speaking goes out from my mouth to your ears. The laws of physics say it could go the other way around, but we know it doesn't. The same with the light from the uh, the lights in the room. There's a thermodynamic arrow. This is the one that people learn about in, in, high, in, in chemistry in high school and, and in physics. Disorder increases with time. Just think of the desk. You put a paper down, another paper. Rooms get messy. They need to be cleaned up. Uh, gravity. Black holes absorb all matter, and we know of no reverse black hole that emits matter, what would be called the white hole. There is a subatomic arrow of time 
that uh, I'll just tell you what it is. It's a bit harder to explain. There are subatomic particles called kaons, and they have antiparticles. We call them anti kaons, which is like a kaon, but we change positive to negative charge. Everything else is the same. It turns out the anti kaons disintegrate faster. And so that's another differential arrow of time. There is a measurement arrow in quantum physics when you have a mixture of quantum states, for those of you that may know what quantum mechanics is, after you measure something in quantum mechanics, these mixtures separate or, if you like, collapse into a particular state. In the quantum world, well, we're used to uh, the classical world. Uh, hmm, let's see. We were, I'm trying to think of a... I had a pencil, I could demonstrate it. We're used to say this glass of water is either here or here. But in quantum mechanics, it's possible for it to be in both places at the same time. But we never directly observe it. We only find where the glass is when we make a particular measurement. And that measurement forces the glass to be in one place or the other with a certain probability we know how to describe. So that's kind of like a measurement arrow of time. And the one we're most familiar with is psychological. We remember yesterday, we don't remember tomorrow. We anticipate tomorrow. And there's a complexity arrow, which is kind of contrary to thermodynamics, but we do see that physical systems, this is a bit cut off on the screen, physical systems with a flow through of energy, like the Earth, get more complex over time. In a closed system, they'll get disordered. But in a system where energy comes in, an output like the sun's energy to the earth, this actually allows complexity to get bigger. So what do we make of this? In 1 Corinthians, we read, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. Where do these arrows come from? Because the everyday laws of physics look the same whether they go forward or backwards. If you want a demonstration, take a movie of a billiard ball hitting other billiard balls on a table. If you run the movie backwards, you don't know which was the right way. Was it forward? Was it backward? Yet, we have at larger scales these arrows. So are these arrows real or are they illusory? Are they different in different places in the universe? Is time always going forward, or will it one day repeat itself? All of these kinds of questions are, at this point, still unsolved scientific problems. And in some sense, I think this insight from Corinthians speaks to that. There is a, a, a mystery which has been hidden from the beginning, and God destined for our glory before time began. This notion there is a beginning of time and a direction. And we have a privilege, I said this earlier today, that we have the ability to actually discover these things, to learn about these things via the scientific method. And that is part of what I, I very much enjoy about being a scientist. So let's talk about how we measure time. Uh, there are lots of ways of measuring time, from Stonehenge to sundials to hourglasses to stop uh, to pocket watches, and then finally to uh, atomic clocks, which is the thing in the middle. And we uh, now have um, the best clock. A uh, strontium ion clock is accurate to two parts in about 100 trillion, I think this number is. We, we have, uh, uh, this is about from four years ago, to my knowledge, this measurement hasn't been improved upon. We have made enormous progress, uh, especially within my lifetime, in our ability to measure time very, very, very accurately. So, what is the second? The second is the duration of 9,192,651,770 periods of the radiation corresponding to the transition between two hyperfine levels of the ground state of the cesium-133 atom. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> so, what we need is we do need a standard 
for what time is, just the way we need a standard for what length is, and this is what is used in science to calibrate all temporal measurements. And the uncertainty has gone down, if you look from the 1940s to now, and it's, it's actually there, I, this is, I don't know if there's an updated graph of this, but we're, we've gone down from parts in a billion, which is this, to parts in one-tenth of a quadrillion, which is basically, uh, oh, how would I say it? Um, a millionth of a billionth, basically. That's how accurate we are able to measure time uh, now. And, oh, actually, I did put in the new limit. The new limit is now way down there. This is now a billionth of a billionth of a second. Now, you might say, I really don't need time to be that accurate, but how accurate can we get? Well, here we run into quantum physics, and probably a number of you have heard of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, one manifestation of which is this equation. It basically says the error you make in measuring the time of a process multiplied by the error you make in measuring the energy exchanged in the process is always bigger than this number we call Planck's constant, which is a very, very tiny number. It's about uh, 10 to the minus 34 in units of normal energy in seconds. Uh, if you ask, well, if the energy is due to gravitational interaction, then you find the shortest time could be is 10 to the minus 43 seconds. In other words, if gravity is a quantum force, it will be subject to this error. And the energy error uh, due to gravity that you would make in a quantum theory of gravity, this is an estimate, but the estimate tells you it's 10 to the minus 43. Uh, basically, one way of looking at this is that if you want to ask how accurate can you make a measurement in gravity uh, of time change, you've got to put energy into the measurement in a very tiny distance. And the limit of that is if you put too much energy in a tiny distance, you'll make a black hole and then you can't measure time. And that's where this boundary comes from of 10 to the minus 43 seconds. If you tried to measure anything faster, your measurement would make a black hole. I'm not making this up. <laughs> so it simply isn't possible to measure time more accurately than this. So now we have an interesting philosophical and maybe theological question. Does time exist if there is no clock that can measure it? Does, do time shorter than 10 to the minus 43 seconds exist or not? We're back to the newtonian leibnizian debate. Newton would say, sure it does. It's not our fault. The clocks can't measure it. Leibniz would say, time is what clocks measure. It doesn't really exist for shorter times than this. They didn't know about quantum physics, of course, but that would be the way the debate would go. So is time continuous or does it come in little pieces? If it comes in little pieces, how does nature jump the gaps? Now, those are a bit less than a second each, but if you imagine they're 10 to the minus 43, does our universe blink into existence every 10 to the minus 43 seconds? In and out like that, is something hidden in between? Again, this seems to be a bit of a mystery. They might know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It's, it's a bit mystical. It does strike me a bit like we, we often theologians say that God, the, law, the laws of nature are upheld by God, and that is what preserves their integrity. And in some sense, I think this highlights that comment. Is God literally making the universe instant to instant or has provided a mechanism that keeps it going? How do we jump these gaps? It's not clear. Or are, that there are gaps. 
Now, what about the perspectives of time? Well, about 100 and almost 20 years ago, uh, Einstein came up with what we now call special relativity, which had basically two postulates. One went back to Newton, that the laws of physics are the same in all inertial reference frames. Inertia means you're going to keep going the way you're going the way you're going until you get pushed or pulled, kicked or dragged or something. So uh, an inertial frame is one where if anything accelerates or changes its motion, you can always figure out what caused it. There's always a force behind it. That's one. But the other one that's a bit funny is that the speed of light is constant in all such frames. Now, this is counterintuitive. Some of you are wondering what it means. Well, it means this. Suppose I'm on a, a thing like a bicycle or maybe this unicycle, <laughs> some of you might have noticed. And I'm zooming along on it. Somebody's zooming along on it this way. And I'm standing over where that pink cushion is. Now, if they're on it and throw a ball toward me, is that ball going to go at the same speed as the unicycle to me, faster or slower? What would you say? Right? You throw the ball. Let's say the unicycle is going 30 kilometers an hour. And they, from their viewpoint, throw it at 10 kilometers an hour. How fast is, am I going to think the ball is coming toward me? 40. 40, right? 30 plus 10. Speed should add up. If a moving thing throws another thing, the speeds add. But that doesn't happen for light. If I shine light from my iPhone right here towards you, that light has a certain speed. Very fast, but you could measure it. If I run toward you, you will measure the same speed. This is a very peculiar property of light that was determined to be the case uh, based on experiments uh, of Michelson and Morley that people couldn't understand. And Einstein's interpretation was the way you understand it is everybody agrees on the speed of light no matter how they're moving. So the consequences of this are very profound. One is nothing can travel faster than light. Contrary to Newtonian theory, things could go arbitrarily fast. There was no reason why anything in principle could go at, at as high a speed as you like. In relativity, no. 300,000 kilometers per second is not only a good idea, it's the law. <laughs> Second, energy, mass is frozen energy. This is probably the best known formula uh, in physics outside of the practitioners of the subject, E equals mc squared. Einstein realized this about two years after proposing the theory in 1907, that mass is frozen energy. In Newtonian theory, the energy of something sitting still was basically zero. But in Einsteinian theory, no, it is pop, this the, the mass of this glass of water has an energy which you get by multiplying the mass by the square of the speed of light. This is a very high speed, so this becomes a very high energy, and it is the energy that is released in nuclear fission and in nuclear fusion. And some of you might have heard about this breakthrough that for the first time, uh, people um, were able to uh, blast a substance together with lasers and get more energy out than what they put in from nuclear fusion. That's a consequence of this formula. And if this process can be controlled and made efficient, it will utterly revolutionize all of our energy sources in the world. Fusion is a source of clean energy. Now, it's not going to be easy because they need, I think, 192 lasers all pointing to at this thing to get it to do that. But we, we achieved break even. This is what powers the sun. Uh, lengths get shorter in the direction of motion. And most paradoxically, time slows down. Moving clocks run slow. This is the most counterintuitive thing of all. We are used to this picture of time. 
that right now it is, what is it, 25 after eight. We all agree on that, and we think the whole world agrees on what now is. Now, people in Ontario, uh, where I live, think, well, it's 25 after 11, and people in Australia think, what would it be, uh, 20, 18 hours, probably noonish or one in the afternoon, roughly. But we would all have the same now. We just have a different perspective on what the clock says because of the way the Earth turns. We all agreed this event started at 7.30. It's going to stop by 9.30. That's the future. This is the non-relativistic view of time. But in fact, because of relativity, because nothing travels faster than light, the future of this place, my future, is simply everything I can affect based on the speed of light. If I sit still, I go forward in time. If I want to communicate with you, I've got to send you something. Throw a ball, uh, write a message and send it in a paper airplane, or perhaps shine a code from my iPhone. You know, on and off and on, and if I had Morris code or something like that. But nothing goes faster than the light from my iPhone. And so my future, the things I can affect, are limited by that speed. So my future is only what's here. Likewise, my past is only the things that could have affected me within the speed of light. So there may be... <laughs> Let's say there are aliens somewhere fighting each other on Jupiter right now, here. I don't know that until the light gets from them to me. And that will take about, I forget how long, something like half an hour or an hour or something. Literally, it has no effect on me. And I cannot affect them until later on. Everybody has their own personal light cone, their own personal past and future. In it's about a nanosecond, right? Do you two know each other? Yeah, you think so? Do you really think you know her? You don't really know her. You only know the way she was two nanoseconds ago. <laughs> How do you know she's the same girl? She could have changed. <laughs> she, you think you know her? You know people change, right? Do you know him? Do you, you trust this guy two nanoseconds ago? No, you can't, right? So it, it, it's, of course it's silly, right? Because our biological systems operate on time scales much longer. But in principle, this is the picture of time. The notion of now, a special instant is spread out to become what we call elsewhere. So this picture of relativistic causality, I'll give you another picture. Here's the Earth going around the sun, right? It will orbit the sun, and uh, here's time going up. So the Earth is here, and then it gets a bit farther away. But let's say something happens to the sun. It's getting redder and redder, and something bad is going to happen. It heats up. And then it explodes. Well, that has no effect on us. If that happened now, we wouldn't know about it for another, how long, anybody know? Eight minutes. Eight minutes. So suppose this happens and we hear a voice from above, from God, prepare to meet thy doom. The sun has exploded. We have eight minutes to either pray or pardon. <laughs> or both. They are not mutually exclusive, actually. Uh, I'm not sure what you would want to do. But what would happen is the light comes out from the sun. We learn eight minutes later that it's exploded. And then after that, chunks of the sun come and get us. It would be really bad news. But this is the way relativity works. This is the light cone of the sun the light cone of the Earth, and until the Earth is within, the, this event is in the past light cone, we can't know about it. We cannot, in principle, know about this. Whereas in the Newtonian way of thinking, this would instantly affect us. That, that, is, the, uh, that is the distinction. This is what we call relativistic causality. So uh, that, that's the, those are the two orbits there. Moreover, we have another feature that 
Uh, it was learned when you properly include gravity in this picture, space and time become curved. And in 1915, Einstein proposed what we call the general theory of relativity, that what we regard as gravity, namely the force that causes my iPhone to fall when I drop it, is actually a manifestation of warping space and time. It's as though without gravity, this little piece of paper would be flat, but gravity warps it and curves space and time. The curvature of time um, is the slowing down of time. The stronger the gravity, the slower all clocks move. And astronauts flying up on space stations actually age more quickly than we do because the gravity up there is a little weaker. Now, it's only one part in a billion, so it doesn't affect them much, but it does affect them. Anybody ever see the movie Interstellar? Yeah, you remember when they go down to that water planet and they're there for how long? 23, half an hour, right? What about that poor guy that was on the ship? How long, how much time passed for that guy? Do you remember? Yes. It was 23 years. And the reason is they were so deep in the gravitational potential well nearby a black hole that they aged much more slowly. And they spent longer than they thought because they encountered this tidal wave and that poor guy up there, I'm surprised he waited for it. Anyway, he did. <laughs> there were, this is a very strange idea, but it made what we would call a retrodiction, namely it explained a shift in the perihelion of Mercury. The perihelion is the position a planet is when it's close to, closest to the sun. And in Newtonian theory, planets follow ellipses round and round. But this theory predicts they go round like spirographs. And I'm greatly exaggerating the effect. But it was observed by Leverrier in 15, uh, 1854 that Newton's theory uh, that Mercury was going on this path with a slight change in the ellipse every 100 years of a teeny tiny amount, and no one could explain it from Newtonian theory. But when Einstein proposed this theory, he used it to calculate this effect, and it exactly predicted it, or uh, retrodicted it, because it was already observed. A prediction was that light would be bent by gravity, that instead of in Newtonian theory, if light went by a heavy object, it would go in a straight line. This is a heavy object, but in Einsteinian theory, it curves. It bends due to the position of the object. And the amount, again, for the sun, which is the heaviest object nearby, is only 1.75 seconds of arc, and arc is one, a uh, second is 1 hundredth of a degree, there are 360 degrees in a circle. It's a very tiny angle, but it's not zero. And this was observed by Eddington. Uh, as I said, curved space is like the difference between a flat thing and a warped thing spatially. Curved time is gravity making clocks run slower. This clock is nearer to the Earth than a, uh, the one on a dirigible which would run more small, slowly. When you take an airplane trip, you're actually aging a little faster than what you would if you hadn't taken the trip. Now, that's not because of the way Air Canada or WestJet operate. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it really, literally, time passes faster for you. The effect, because of the weakness of Earth's gravity, is very, very tiny. But if you were near a neutron star, Time passes at about half the rate on the surface of a neutron star relative to being far away from it. So it can be a very dramatic effect. And then finally, we get to objects called black holes, with which Kitty Ferguson said rather poetically are prisons of light. Now, the idea of a black hole was conceived by the Reverend John Michel in 1783. And it's a region of space where to get away from it, you'd have to go faster than the speed of light. To get away from the Earth's gravity, if you launch a rocket, it's got to go faster than about 11 kilometers per second. If, if it goes slower than that, it'll go up and fall down. But if it does that, it will escape Earth's gravity and fly off to the moon or wherever you want. Well, 
if the, if the escape velocity is bigger than light, John Michel wondered, what would these things be? He said, well, it'd be dark stars because the star would shine light, but the light would get pulled back and you would only know about them by how their gravity influenced nearby stars. But that was a curiosity forgotten about until Einstein's theory came along and people rediscovered these things. Um, <clears throat> And because nothing goes faster than light, they are inescapable prisons of everything, including light. The black hole is basically a region of space bounded by what we call a trapped surface for which both incoming, ingoing and outgoing light rays have negative expansion. That's the technical term. But it basically means if you're within a black hole and you shine a light, the light won't go out and start going closer to the black hole. Of course, if you shine it toward the middle, it will also go closer. Toward the middle is the ingoing, but if you shine it out, the gravity is so strong, it'll continue to pull it in, as it will for everything else. So if you remember those little light cones, if you can see from the back, this is far away from the black hole. Those little light cones that tell us past and future look ordinary, but as you get close to the black hole, they tilt. And at the edge of the black hole, the light cones all tilt toward the center, which is a way of saying the entire future of anything here is in the hole and you never, ever, ever, ever get out. So, well, that's what we know about time. Time is fungible. Our perspective on time depends on how strong the gravity is and on the motion of the observer measuring it or of the clock measuring time. So we have um, a number of questions that come out of relativity. Is, to go back to Laplace, is the future fully determined? Uh, there's this notion of a block universe that says all of the laws of nature and the history of universe is irrefutably fixed from right at the beginning to its ultimate future. There isn't really anything that's not determined. Or maybe not. Maybe there's enough flexibility in the curvature of space and time and the laws of physics that the nature is open to genuine novelty, that we have a developing universe where the future is not actually fixed and which view is in better accord with experience. My own personal view is it's actually the latter one that God has created a universe where there's enough structure to time that things aren't chaotic, but it's not so rigid that we don't get to make meaningful choices in life. The tennis player actually is choosing how to hit the ball to the opposing player. So that's something to think about. There is the block universe is a little bit reflected in this passage from Revelation. I am the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end, there is, I think, a large scale theological picture and structure to God's plan for the universe. But I think we need to entertain the notion there's fungibility and flexibility in the middle. But I'll go on to the last point, destiny. Now, what we used to think before 1998 is gravity would govern everything at the largest scales of the universe. And the universe was expanding, but it was galaxies expanding and they're gravitationally attractive. So somewhat analogous to the way that if I throw something up, it comes down again because it's attracted to the Earth. Likewise, the galaxies are attracted to each other as they expand. So the expansion should be slowing down over time. And the question was, does it slow down enough that the galaxies will in the future one day come back together? Or is it weak enough that although it'll slow down, slow down, it will never come to a stop? Or at the end of time, will it exactly stop? The red curve is, we're, we're over here somewhere now in the universe, but way, way, way in the future, billions of years, in the first case, gravity strong enough that we'll re-collapse. The universe will go like this. In the yellow curve here, I don't know if you can see it, it's, it's, the expansion has been so much 
that although it slows down, it will never recollapse. And this one is you come to a stop in infinite time, that the galaxies will just slow to a stop at the end of history. Well, the parameter that is used to measure this is the actual mass of the universe divided by the amount to be on this green curve. So if this number is less than one, you're on the yellow curve. If this number is bigger than one, you're on the red curve. Bigger than one, you're heavier, it's gonna re-collapse. Less than one, you're lighter, you're gonna expand exactly one, you're gonna be there. Well, there was a big surprise in the late 1990s when the boomerang data measured um, changes in the residual heat from the Big Bang that suggested the universe was nearly flat, and then observations of supernova indicated that the rate of, ex of acceleration of the universe, the amount of slowdown, was negative. Now, if what is a negative slowdown? Speed up. A speed up. In other words, instead of gravity putting the brakes on the expansion, something is hitting the accelerator. And in fact, this is now a very well-established picture. Not only is the universe expanding, it's expanding faster and faster every day, which is very surprising. Uh, here is a, an older picture of the data where it was first found, where one looks at this energy density parameter of matter, what was introduced was a new parameter, the density of what we call dark energy. And the feature of dark energy is its gravitationally repulsive energy, energy that causes things to accelerate instead of, a, energy that causes things to repel each other instead of attract, and therefore we get uh, an acceleration. And there are various, this data has been refined since, but the, the key point was that the supernova data said the values of these numbers lie in this yellow band. The boomerang data said they also have to be in the blue. So the overlap between them is true, and it meant there was some dark energy. It wasn't zero, and we did have a universe that was expanding. And if the universe had, on a very large scale, no curvature, in other words, it wasn't positive like this or negative like a saddle, it was almost exactly flat, you'd be on the red line, and the red line is indeed within the overlap of the data, and as time has gone on, this blue part has gotten narrower and narrow, and so is the yellow part, and we now know pretty accurately that this is indeed the case. It looks like we're in a nearly flat universe speeding up in its expansion. Why? You know, we call it dark energy, but that's just a way of saying there's a source of acceleration. We don't know what it is. The simplest explanation is a cosmological constant. But I think this is pause for theological reflection. What does it mean? And here, based on this data, is a brief history of our future. Our sun is burning hydrogen into helium, and we survive because of that. But in about five billion years, the sun is going to burn out. And then in another thousand billion years, a trillion years, the background heat from the Big Bang is going to cool to its minimum possible temperature. And then in another 10,000 billion years, the acceleration will have pushed all galaxies out of existence. So if there are beings surviving that long, they will see nothing else in the universe but our own galaxy. Because the others will all be pushed out too far to see. And then Star formation is going to end, and then here's all kinds of other stuff. I'm going to read these numbers. They're very long. All stable matter will begin to decay. Black holes will gobble up most of the rest. Then after that, uh, black holes ultimately will begin to evaporate, and then about a Google of years, not the Google you search for, a Google is the number one followed by uh, 100 zeros. In other words, I, I, I don't even know how to read it, but as a kid, I, loved, I was fascinated by the number that had the name. All black holes will evaporate if Hawking is right, and there will be nothing left in the universe but cold light. We live here 
But eventually, stars burn out around here. Black holes dominate the whole universe for a very long time, but they fade out, and then there's just nothing. Just the universe is a gigantic, dilute blackness. Well, could life survive this law? This was looked at by a couple of people. All forms of life need food or energy. So as the universe accelerates, the energy density declines. The energy supply of the universe, because it's accelerating, runs away faster than any life form that can, that can collect it. So we've got this expanding, accelerating universe, and we might develop life that runs fast enough to get some of it, but by the time we get it and eat it, all this stuff is out of the way. So is it possible to survive? Well, some people, there had been a suggestion, maybe we, you know, a future civilization could exploit the black holes to collect energy, but to do this forever, you would need a black hole as big as the universe. Try to get funding for that. <laughs> well, could we self-evolve to lower and lower metabolism so we needed less and less energy? Well, that would mean our body temperatures or the body temperatures of life form go down and down, but the trouble is eventually they would go to the minimum cosmological temperature and then you can't do anything because you're buffeted about by randomness and your body processes would all just stop working. <laughs> could you hibernate like a bear does and wake up periodically? Well, as the universe loses energy, eventually all alarm clocks will break down due to quantum effects. So one day you'll go to sleep and you won't wake up. And maybe you could jump into a black hole to a new universe. Okay, but you go first. <laughs> so it's a very interesting uh, situation that scientific knowledge pre presents us with. This picture of doom, now everything is... This is a 10 to the 100 years, a Google of years. I mean, come on. You guys get paid for this? Actually, we do get paid for this, which is kind of fun. But there are other dooms perhaps a bit sooner, uh, as floods were experienced somewhat recently in this part of the world. And we do have very good evidence the planet is, is warming up. And so... We have, this is called the subject of scientific eschatology. Uh, many members of the Christian community are concerned about debates from the beginning. Um, I'm a bit more with John Polkinghorne. I think it's the end of the universe that's a bit more theologically disturbing than the beginning. The cosmological argument that I've presented, if we're right about current science and we could learn new things, so this has to be um, held tentatively, says doom is ultimately certain. All, ultimately, all sorts of energy dilute to uselessness in 10 to the 100 years. That seems inescapable. The argument from climatology is that maybe there is doom nearby. Now, here we can do something about it and foist it off, uh, which I certainly hope is the case. But then we have another argument about doom, the argument from biology. Nobody lives forever. Human life expectancy is currently about 80 years. We are gifted with life, but we don't, we all know this gift does not go on indefinitely. And we have no known mechanism for to stop surviving one's own death, or as Keynes put it in the long run, we're all dead. Or as Isaiah put it, all are like grass and they're glorious like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fail. But the word of the Lord lasts forever, which I guess maybe I couldn't written down. So what are the responses as we contemplate this long-run notion of time in terms of destiny? Well, one is denial, as it says in the book of Luke, uh, not as an a thing to be advocated, but as a commentary Jesus made on the attitudes of some people. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow you're going to die. One is despairs, exemplified in the book of Ecclesiastes. My heart began to despair after all my toilsome labor under the sun. Or... We might proclaim a notion of hope. 
that we are hard pressed, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair. And this is where I would end. And this is uh, what I believe the Christian response to scientific eschatology is the response we have to other forms, perhaps, of doom and gloom. Our hope is in the resurrection of Christ. We have a hope that that means there's a resurrection of the self, and we have a hope, I think, that there will be a restoration and resurrection of the cosmos. If Christ is not raised, our faith is in vain, as it says there. So yes, we, we bank on this. We have empirical evidence that it happened, but we ultimately are, Christians are people of hope. We are, despite the gloom and doom of scientific eschatology, whether it's crazy stuff in 10 to the 100 years, or whether it's stuff that's much more uh, threatening and immediate, like the change in climate, we, we are hard pressed, but we are not in despair. And I would like to encourage us as we think about time, I hope these different perspectives I've presented on time cause you to theologically reflect and think. What I've tried to present you is we don't understand time fully scientifically. We understand some things, but there is an openness to understanding that I hope will make us think theologically and reflect on what it is for God to be God and our relationship to God in the context of time and in the context of hope. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rob, for your great presentation, walking us through time and doing that uh, in a reasonable amount of time. <laughs> so um, we have some time for questions. Yeah, there's two oh. over there. Rob, go ahead. Yeah, you, you talked about dark energy. And if I understand it correctly, there's also this idea of dark matter. Yeah. That the uh, what we can see is just a fraction of what actually exists. Yeah. What are the implications of that, do you think, in terms of the reality of the universe? Okay, so first of all, the distinction between dark matter and dark energy, the dark part means they are not visible with light or electromagnetism. The, the matter part means there's some dark stuff that is gravitationally attractive. And we know that this, well, we have very strong evidence this is the case for galaxies, that the mass of a galaxy is not just the visible stuff we see. They seem to be surrounded by halos of dark stuff that uh, we think are there, we're pretty sure they're there, because the stars that are, all galaxies have some stars and globular clusters a bit away from the spiral type disk, and they are moving in a way that is not consistent with empty space, but is consistent with a halo of dark matter. So that's why that is. Um, dark energy, by definition, is gravitationally repulsive. The simplest explanation it is a constant <clears throat> vacuum energy, energy of empty space everywhere that is repulsive. But there may be other things. What is the implication for the universe? Well, we don't entirely know yet. There are experiments going on, uh, for example, in Sudbury at Snow Lab to try and directly detect particles of dark matter. We know what dark matter is not. It is not normal planets that we just can't see because they're too dim. It's, we're pretty sure it's not a lot of tiny black holes floating around the galaxy or just outside of the galaxy in a halo. It doesn't seem to be made of normal stuff that we learn about in chemistry in high school. So we know what it's not, but that means we don't know what it is. Some people think, because it hasn't been found yet, that actually there isn't any of this stuff and that we've got to change our theory of gravity so that these stars that aren't moving right in what we think gravity is will move properly in this other theory. So it's, it's an open scientific question. And I think we need to be tentative in our understanding of, of that, of the universe. And I would say, if you're 
if you want to think theologically, I think it does mean as we develop pictures and understanding of God and God's relationship to the universe, we also need to hold these pictures tentatively. They could be open to revision of some kind for the same reasons. That would be one way. There was a question. Yeah, Daniel, do you have a question? Go yeah, I noticed that you did not uh, mention multiverse because it's out of reach of science. Pardon me? There could be many universes and multiverse because it cannot be accessed by science. Yeah, so I am not a fan of the multiverse, much as I like Spider-Man No Way Home. Um, the, so the idea of the multiverse came about, uh, there, it has several roots, but the main reason it came about is that our universe and its, its origination and its development and structure seems to depend on very special conditions. In other words, we now know enough about physics that we know the laws that govern our universe and its structure on a lot of scales, big cosmic scales and atomic ones. But that means we also can ask, well, what if those laws were a little bit different? What if we changed how strong electricity was or, or, how, or if we changed the relative mass of the neutron and proton? Well, what we discover surprisingly is that our universe is not typical. It doesn't look very much the same if we change these things even a little bit. And if we're just one thing, that would say, oh, that's a coincidence. But there are lots and lots of these properties of the universe, the strength of the cosmic expansion, the relative masses of the neutron, of the proton, of the electron, the strength of electricity and magnetism. Now, there's a big long list. It's too long to say these are all just coincidences or so people think. So the question is, why is our universe so atypical? Why isn't it a garden variety, any old thing? That's what I was taught when I was uh, in my teens or what I read in books. So our universe would sort of look the same no matter how it got started. We know that is not correct now. So the proposal of the multiverse is, well, the reason why we're special is in fact, there were lots of universes made way back when, and we call the whole collection a multiverse. So, uh, there, so the idea is we're only in special conditions, uh, analogous somewhat to the way when you hold a lottery, many people buy tickets, but there's only one winning ticket. And the idea is the special conditions of our universe that make life possible. They're like the winning lottery ticket, but all the other universes bought lottery tickets and they don't have life and they lose. But they're not observable by definition. So you then ask, is this science? Uh, and there is a debate about that. I, I, I think it does venture, if not outside the bounds of science, certainly to the very edges. You do have to ask if, if you're positing something that is never observable, are you really doing science? Second, my own view is this idea creates more problems than it solves. The problem is once you start, where do you stop? How, how much multiverse do you want? It is, if there were two or three, okay, but if it just goes on and on indefinitely, you undermine the induction principle of the sciences. Thanks for a great talk. You showed some equations and a lot of the laws of nature are formulated as equations where you can sort of jump forward in time from your equation and predict the future. Wolfram, Stephen Wolfram has uh, been doing some work emphasizing, you know, life as an algorithmic universe and, and sort of having to do the work to step through uh, and, and know the future you have to, you have to go through, there's not a sort of shortcut. So do you, what do you think about his work and do you think that um, that maybe we've been too restrictive in thinking of laws of nature as you know certain equations that have a lot to do with the history of, of the mathematics that were invented uh, when when we could you know invent new mathematics and have new insights? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Um, the uh, So first I'd say, I mean, we do have this structure that's been built up over the centuries uh, and in particular in the last 50 some odd years 
uh, maybe a bit more, of, of what we now call uh, the standard model of physics. And it very well describes uh, all of what we know at the subatomic level and at the cosmological level. So, of course, anyone is welcome to come up with something different, but it's not that easy because it's got to have at least as much explanatory power as what we've got now. And so while Wolfram's idea is an idea, uh, if I understand it right, it's the cellular automaton idea where you've got something in a state and uh, you, you, the universe is like an array of pixels and some are dark and some are light. And whether something changes from dark to light depends on what the other stuff around it does. And you can get some kind of evolution of things. And, you know, on the one hand, in terms of a different idea, yeah, it's different. But it hasn't, to the best of my knowledge, had the explanatory power that what we have now. So until that can be demonstrated, even in a very restricted sense, okay, I mean, that's his idea. It hasn't caught on, and I think that's the reason why. So that, that would be what I, what I would say to that. Um, but, you know, anyone is welcome to try other scientific ideas. The problem is, what's what I like to tell my students, if you want to come up with a new theory, you need to get people to... So you need to get somebody besides your mother to think it's a good theory. Okay. I think Mark had a question here. Mark, 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 was well, in the back, I noticed the question as yeah, well. So that, 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 yeah. Thank you. So go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you. I was wondering, so you said that the, um, nothing moves faster than the speed of light. Yes. And um, so we, I think there's like a beginning to the universe. So I was yes. wondering if um, like the universe, the expansion of the universe, exceeds the speed of light or if that's a relevant question um and i was also wondering like basically yeah like is all of everything you see is that within the light cone of the moment of creation okay so regarding the first one uh the answer paradoxically is yes the universe is expanding faster than light. You may think, what the heck? Were you lying to me all this time? Well, it, it's what is expanding is empty space between things. But it has been shown that you cannot use that expansion to send any signal to go outside the light cone. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, the rule really in relativity is that information cannot go faster than light. But there's nothing against the laws that say empty space can't get bigger and bigger faster than light. So I'm not making this up. This is really what happens. Now, what was the other question? Sorry. Oh, it was, I think the same, along the same lines, like is the moment of creation, um, the light cone from that point, is everything that we see within that light cone? Uh, probably not. So the universe could have been, if you look at us now, you can say, okay, let's just draw our light cone backwards 13.8 billion years, and we will get to a region of space. But it is quite possible, in fact, we think it is likely that actual space is bigger than the region that affected us. In other words, there are literally parts of the universe outside of anything that could ever have influenced anything we see in the universe now. And it's an interesting question as to how big it is. My personal view is that this cannot be infinite in size, because if it is, you run into very peculiar things you have to believe that go back to the multiverse problem. And George Ellis and uh, Hendrik Bundrit pointed this out in 19... 79, uh, the short story is that if you look at the Big Bang, there's a mess of matter and energy way, way back there or something, maybe an instant after. Now, suppose we know there's stuff outside of that. So they said, well, suppose this matter and energy is spread everywhere uniformly and fluctuates. Well, if the universe is infinite, way, 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 way out there somewhere, you're going to get conditions that are identical to the ones that made our universe and us. And what that means is, way, 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 way out there, I'm giving this talk. 
and all of you are listening to it. And if you go just as far again, I'm doing it again, and again, and again. And this is the problem with an infinite universe, that you do something, either that really is the case, or something stops that process. My own view is it is the latter. One way is the universe doesn't go on infinitely. It may close back on itself. Yeah. So our friend here asks, uh, scientists before the 1900s had a firm understanding of thermodynamics. So why did they think a universe bound by entropy could have no beginning? Wouldn't a universe with entropy and no beginning be completely stagnant and desolate? Yeah, that, the, the entropy of the universe is a big puzzle. And uh, if you, um, let me see if I can uh, uh, remember this uh, correctly. The uh, Penrose has commented on this point that in fact, uh, from the viewpoint of gravity and the entropy of gravity, it looks like the universe started in a very highly ordered state. We think of the mass and energy of like the air of this room has some disorder and heat has some disorder. Were you the star, our, our sun is a star that's burning. We think of that as having entropy and it does, but all of that entropy is teeny, 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 tiny compared to the entropy of a black hole, assuming our understanding of black holes is correct. So the problem is that if you, um, you might ask on thermodynamic grounds, what would the universe have to look like to be the most disordered possible? The answer is it would be a giant black hole. But evidently it's not. It's in a more ordered state. And if you go backwards in time, it's even more and more ordered because there's less and less black holes. So Penrose is asked, well, why that? What the heck? Why is this? And we don't yet have a good answer to this question as to why it started in what gravitate from grounds of non-gravitational stuff like particles and matter it looks disordered but from the viewpoint of gravity it looks unbelievably finely ordered and that is another puzzle in fact because of the nature of it some people wonder if it really is a puzzle or not but but he thinks it is and i'm a bit agnostic i I think it very well could be, uh, but we don't have a good answer to that question. But but the the amount of ordering is like picking. It would be as though we said one of the molecules of air in this room is very special, and there it is right there. I just randomly found it like that, and in fact, it's like that, but multiplied by a factor of ten to the one hundred. That's how finely tuned it is. But we don't know why. Theological, is this God selecting things? I don't see how we can rule that out, but I also wouldn't want to say that, uh, well, I would say if we find a mechanism, my guess is that'll make God look good. We'll know how God did. That's all. Anyway, that, that's, it, it's a very good question, and we don't yet have a good scientific answer to it. Well, thank you, Rob, for guiding us through some of these mysteries. Uh, so uh, we appreciate uh, your presence with us today and yesterday at Trinity Western here at, at UBC. And, um, and uh, there are, as you can see, we've made a lot of progress over the last 50 years in learning lots of things, but there's still many, many mysteries. And around the corner, we're going to learn something new all the time. And that's sort of one of the wonders of the scientific work. And, and as Christians doing science, uh, we can uh, know that God has uh, all kinds of interesting things for us to do for the, for the rest of our lives. And uh, I would like maybe, maybe to end with a word of prayer as well and then wish you uh, well on, the, on, on your ways home. So let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your presence with us today and for your guidance uh, throughout uh, the history of this world and for allowing us to uh, peek into some of the mysteries of how you have uh, structured things for uh, for us to be here and for us to uh, explore and, and to, to learn more about you. 
thank you that uh, we've had the opportunity to uh, experience and, and understand more today. And I pray that you would be with us the rest of this evening and give everyone safe travel home, uh, whether that's locally or whether that's back in Ontario, as Rob will be heading back tomorrow. I pray that you would uh, continue to uh, bless the CSCA and, and give us another wonderful 50 years of explorations uh, in fellowship uh, networking together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.